the idea of the public sphere and its relation to democracy. And more specifically, the way in which competing truth claims are managed in the public realm of human social interaction in democracies, as opposed to authoritarian cultural, social, and political systems. I will address this phenomenon in the public sphere, drawing upon a broader frame, framework that is usually used in contemporary social and ethical discussions of the concept. Thus, I would like to address both historical, theological, and ethical perspectives related, in, uh, related to this general question of the nature of democracy, the public sphere, and the functional approach to conflicting assertions of truth in the public sphere and in a democracy. When we start to think about democracy, the public, and its way of dealing with conflicts in public, we often look back to our foundations, our legal constitutions, and the deeper bedrock of traditions in legal, philosophical, and religious sources as guides for reconciling the conflicts and finding common ground. There is, however, another way to return to supposed foundations, a way that has led to horrific ends in many cases, this searching for foundation or for a foundation is often conceptualized not in legal and ethical thought, but in ethnic and racist ideology of a unified race as the ultimate unification of the state and solution to the conflicts in society in order to reach a new harmony of social order beyond the conflict. This method led to disastrous ends in the 20th century, as we all know, and is still a real threat to us today. The most horrific example of the disaster of this way of thinking is found in German National Socialism and the conception of the German master race and all the related horrors that followed from this racist ideology, including the slaughter of millions of Jews in the Holocaust and the war crimes and all the brutality across Europe and not least in Eastern Europe during World War II. Another horrific disaster of political order is communism. One party authoritarian rule, which deals with conflicts by eliminating opposition, silencing the freedom of speech, persecuting dissenting voices and limiting the freedom of thought, the freedom of movement and the freedom of economic exchange. As a political system, it has never really worked in the sense of promoting human flourishing for it does not allow human beings to be true citizens who participate in free elections and the formation of representative government or in this public sphere as free voices of reason. It holds them down and keeps them in a status of non-citizenship. Communism does not permit true citizenship and only allows for people to be passive subjects under authoritarian rule. It is an ideology that also justified brutality and inhumanity as we know from history. National socialists or fascists and communist conceptions of political order led to millions of innocent deaths, literally rivers of human blood and mountains of human corpses. These ways of thinking and organizing social and political life have caused unspeakable destruction and embodied evil in ways that no other political ideology has. The only real alternative to these conceptions of human order is the political system marked by the freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of the press, freedom of elections, and freedom of dissent, and thus tolerance of difference and acceptance of plurality. In a nutshell, free democracy or liberal democracy in the sense of libea, which is Latin for free, Free democracy is not perfect, and it never was, and it never will be. Even the old democratic order in America has entered but another phase of deep soul searching and conflict, social disarray in many regards, and a new questioning of the legitimacy of elections, and a disturbing inward looking attitude amidst the daily tragedy of gun violence. Free democratic orders are not 
perfect and they have many problems. They always go through times of testing and trial. There will always be new challenges, both domestically and internationally, that they must work through. But they offer us a more promising path of development than the alternative conceptions of political order. What lies at the heart of this conception of free democracy? What is the bedrock of the idea? What drives it along and keeps it going? Democracy is different than fascism and communism and different than the authoritarian orders of strongmen. Democracy lives from and is driven forward, not from the few, but from the many. Fascism and communism, authoritarian autocracies are organized by individuals and small groups surrounded by large groups of yes men or collaborators and the masses that fall into line behind them and have actually little to say in the daily operation of things. The middle level of power, or the yes men or the collaborators in these regimes, are a key part of the system in authoritarian orders. They are supporters who agree with the dictates of the authoritarian powers, who may actually have different opinions in private, or, or, or who may actually want to disagree or actually do disagree. But rather than speaking their mind freely, they simply say yes to the authoritarian authority and go along with everything. They support the system of authoritarian order and do not speak their mind freely to the autocrats who are in power. They know, of course, that if they would speak out against it, they would be perse persecuted, killed, or moved from their office, demoted to a lower position, or in less radical cases, simply criticized and humiliated for their so-called arrogant posture of self-assertion against the strong man. In many cases, of course, they passionately support the system. Democracy in its ideal form seeks to reject this idea of yes men or silent collaborators. Of course, all modern democracies have their own yes men, silent collaborators, but this role of passive servant in the upper echelons of authority is actually contrary to the democratic system in the ideal form. The basic idea in democracy is that we speak our mind freely, like Miroslav Marinovich did in 1977 when he distributed flyers about human rights violations in Soviet Ukraine and was subsequently seven, uh, sentenced to seven years in the gulag and another five years in exile. Marinovich was living democracy in these actions of freedom and profit protest in the 1970s. He is a role model in the sense of free thinking and free action and in the taking of risks for the sake of justice, speaking out and taking a stand in a dangerous world. This is the sense of democracy in real life, free thinking, free speech, as long as this freedom of speech is not intended to be an insult or slander, which I'll address later, and free action, including the action of freely electing, that is freely choosing these politicians or those politicians, who the citizens see as most worthy of our support, who are ideally committed to the higher ideals of justice, truth, and who are ideally morally exemplary citizens in their public and private life. Obviously, this is not always the case in our modern democracies. Sadly, in many occasions, our choice is between two or more non-ideal representatives. Yet the basic idea of democracy is that we are free to choose and that we are we as citizens actually do choose our representatives in this process of free election this free election as it should be ideally is inseparable from freedom of speech for in the speech we talk about these potential elected officials it is inseparable as well from freedom of the press to tell the whole story about the work and the ideas of the politicians and to shed light on their political agendas. This freedom is the real bedrock of our democratic orders. If this freedom is lost or if it's taken away, it changes everything. It changes tradition, it changes our families, it changes our law, it changes the culture in which we live, it changes our religion, 
and it changes our society. It can obviously run afoul or go astray, this freedom, in which situations the collective freedom of the citizens is not directed to higher ideals, but to lower instincts, such as the hatred and exclusion of minority groups. This misuse of freedom is one of the major challenges in the function of democracy. It is the paradox, really, of freedom and democracy. Because democracy is based on freedom, politicians can use the public sphere of free discourse for the promotion of ideas that are not virtuous. If this freedom is the essential bedrock upon which the cultural, social, and political order must be established in our democracies, what are the examples that we have from history to show us how it deals with conflicting claims to truth? If we are really honest about this question, we must say that we have no perfect examples. Every one of our examples of this high ideal are imperfect. Human beings are simply not perfect creatures and the cultural, social and political orders they establish always bear the marks of this imperfection. Because of, because of this abiding imperfection, there is a need for a political system that allows for the correction of the imperfection and a shedding of light on the errors. There's a need for a political and social order in which there is an open and public discussion of bad or wrong decisions so that they can be made right. There is a need for open and public discussion of crime and corruption so the crime can be punished and the corruption can be made transparent and rectified to a good order based on fairness, openness, and good rules of competition. This is another reason why free democracy is better than fascist and communist systems and all authoritarian orders ruled by strong men or a small group of the powerful. Free democracy allows for this open discussion about political leaders, about public figures, about errors, about bad decisions, about corruption and about crime. The other systems they formally reject corruption and other problems in social and political life, but they do not always allow for a truly open discussion about it. Only in free democracies is there a truly open discussion about the problems of the different societies in which we live. Even if we do not have perfect examples of this, we have fragments and some examples that help us to understand the higher ideals. I would like to now talk about a very old example. Freedom of opinion and the open exchange of ideas and debate was essential to the Greek tradition in the marketplace of, good, of goods and ideas epitomized in the ancient Athenian agora. And I'm gonna now show you a um, picture of this agora that I'm talking about right now. That is the marketplace of Athens. As the historian John Camp has described it, the agora, which you can now see on your screen, was the large open meeting place where many or most Athenians gathered every day, not once a week, not once a month, every single day they gathered in public. I have to imagine that for a moment, how significant public life was for the ancient Athenians, every single day, where a great variety of activities took place, including markets, elections, dramatic performances, athletic events, military drills, and even religious processions. In the Agora, the facilities were provided for the three main branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. Those are citations from camp. The Agora was the center of commerce, spectacle, and social interchange. In the open space, the open space in the adjacent buildings provided the venues for a host of daily activities. The Agora was distinctly Greek, and not all ancient societies had need of such a center. Again, indeed, the concept of a large central public square was passed on from Greece through the fora, which is plural for forum, 
of imperial Roman cities um, to most European capitals. In Athens, the Agora served also as the center of most government activity where democracy was invented and practiced by the citizens over the course of two centuries. Again, citations from Cam. The beating heart of democracy is this space of exchange and debate among the many, the social interchange. The space of debate in the public sphere was also exemplified on the smaller scale in the Roman senatorial disputes regarding the uh, status civitatis. Clearly, um, the Western tradition of democratic order, the rule of the many, through representation has its primary roots in the Greco-Roman tradition and the idea of the political order as a res publica, a public matter, which is the origin of course of the term republic in most of our um, democracies, they're Republican democracies in this sense. So I wanted to show you this picture so you can see the Agora as this um, original um, place where uh, democratic culture in the Greek tradition was cultivated and in many regards emerged, a place where many, many different things took place um, in social and political and cultural life. <clears throat> if we now think about this idea from a religious perspective, which is, which is certainly one of the other major points of departure for the conceptual movement towards democratic order, we can focus on the religious traditions of Judaism and Christianity. This argument is well known in Catholic academic circles as one, an argument associated with the Catholic philosopher, uh, Jacques Maritain, but also Robert Schumann should be named among many others. Um, both of them saw the emergence of democracy and especially the idea of free and equal people who have equal rights as closely related to the basic impulses from Christianity. There is certainly some truth to this claim, and there is also an older story to be told here, for there is actually a plurality of sources that led to this democratic idea of the public sphere determining the public matters, the res publica. There are many sources dispersed in various narratives and impulses within the ancient tradition, including the emergence of a positive assertion of monotheism in ancient Israel and the Exodus narrative, but also more concretely, the fundamental theology of the Ten Commandments, the divine initiation of a political community based on shalom or peace, which the position of the king, in which the position of the king was taken by the people. By contrast, King Cyrus of Persia despised the idea of the Agora, and the ancient Assyrian order viewed the king as the divine representative. In both of these cases, the ancient tradition of Judaism offered in a completely different concept. The Assyrian version of political contract was fundamentally modified in the ancient tradition of the Old Testament of the book of Deuteronomy. The Judean king Manasseh was probably one of the many figures who was subjected to the older Assyrian oath. Yet within the shift of the Old Testament traditions, the nature of this oath and the very parties involved, and thus the very nature of the conceptualized authority itself, and thus the basis of the interrelationship between the parties, is dramatically transformed. As Jan Asman explains, God does not make this treaty with the king in his capacity as the people's representatives before God, but directly with the people themselves. This is in the book of Deuteronomy. In addition to this, the loyalty clauses are not between the people and the king in his capacity as God's representatives before the people, but between the people and God. Again, citations from Asman. One may rightly interpret this dramatic shift to the roles and relativization of the traditional authority structures as a deep intellectual shift in human sociality and political order. Asman argues persuasively along these lines in the citation, quote, the fact that God makes this his covenant with the people as a whole, rather than through the intercession of royalty priest or some other representative authority, becomes the basis for a new specific, emphatic, and in some extent democratic conception of the people. The people, not Moses, not the 70 elders, not Aaron, not the Levites, 
the people assume the role of a sovereign partner in this covenant with God. This directness of access to God and in what lends the biblical concept is what lends the biblical concept its democratic force, um, end quote. The implications of this shift are enormous, not least when considering the widely held view of the king as the son of God in antiquity, a position which is now, as Osman argued, um, occupied by the people in the book of Hosea and in Deuteronomy and in Exodus. Thus, the covenant dispenses with the need for a king whose role is now taken over by the people. The establishment of a king is presented in utterly negative terms later in the book of Samuel, as, as well as in the situation of Samuel's sons who took bribes and perverted justice. Indeed, all of this is from 1 Samuel 1, 1 Samuel 8, chapter 8. Indeed, the wish for a king is understood in God's message to Samuel as the people's rejection of God as their king. They have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me from being king over them. The people of Israel wanted a king, and the prophet Samuel told the people, you should not do this. And then God finally gave them the king that they wanted, Saul and then David. But the, Samuel, the prophet Samuel said, when this happened, you're making a bad decision <laughs> in introducing this monarchy. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 8. This is followed by Samuel's critique of the monarchy as despotic and corrupt, self-interested and unjust. This criticism of kings re-emerged strongly later in the early modern period in many different contexts. In fact, this passage from the Old Testament from 1 Samuel 8 was one of their favorite Bible passages when many people began to talk about politics and from a Christian perspective in the endorsement of a new Republican order. It resonated with them because they saw the monarchy as a constructed uh, political system from a tradition of oppression and injustice and arbitrary power, one neglecting in the equality of human beings. With this criticism of the monarchical system, um, in different forms, some more radical, some less radical, some more accommodating. Um, there was a new emphasis on freedom, the freedom of the citizens. With this, an emphasis on freedom we find, for example, in the English philosopher uh, um, John Locke, who claimed in his uh, works from the 1680s that there was a, quote, equal right that every man has to his natural freedom without being subjected to the will or authority of another. In this sense, the end of law or the purpose of law is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and to enlarge human freedom. Indeed, the law that was to govern Adam, that God gave to Adam in the creation, was to be the same law that would govern all of his posterity, the law of reason. This basic idea was drawn from the conviction that everyone is created equal by God, and that God gave everyone reason to govern their affairs and freedom. This is an idea developed by John Locke, drawing upon older sources and traditions. But also the Dutchman, Baruch Spinoza, also argued in this sense. He held, quote, it is not, I contend, the purpose of the state to turn people from rational beings into beasts or automata, so to in, turn them into machines that they control, but rather allow their minds and bodies to develop in their own ways in security and enjoy the free use of reason and not to participate in conflicts based, based on hatred, anger, and deceit or in malicious disputes with each other. Therefore, the true purpose of the state is, in fact, freedom." End quote. This brings me to this question, how does church, how does culture, how does education, society, how does politics, how do these realms of human life look when they take these ideas to heart and actually encourage people to embrace the free use of reason while avoiding conflicts based on hatred, to be free in their thinking, to be free in their thoughts, to be free in their words, but not to do this in such a way that they use their words as damaging in the sense of hate. This is a 
really high ideal, but it is at the root of the basic idea of a free democracy. And it can be embraced in any religious tradition that seeks to find ways to include these basic principles of freedom and reason. These ideas have deep roots in specific intellectual and religious traditions, yet they do not belong to any specific confession or any specific religious tradition. They are, in the fullest sense of the word, universal. Free democracy, as it is understood in this sense, presume, presumes a sphere of open and public discussion in which this freedom to use reason and freedom to use common sense arguments is not held dormant or kept private, but is enacted publicly. The concept of the public sphere is rooted in and related to this basic idea of a common sense and really the basic idea of a democratic forum or marketplace epitomized in the Athenian Agora. Common sense free thinking is foundational to democratic cultures based on egalitarianism, which is the concept of equality between people. And the belief that every human being, by virtue of their common sense, is capable of understanding the world, responsibly acting within it, and taking responsibility in self-government. In this sense, it implies a relatively high anthropology or understanding of the human being, that they are capable of understanding the world and responsibly acting in it. Yet, it, even if it holds this high anthropology, it is nevertheless wise enough this common sense tradition to know that humans can always be deceived. The alternative here is the idea that there is only there are only a few of us who have a true sense of things who are truly insightful or who have a true understanding of a reality and only a few have insight and that these few must rule the many. This is the dangerous idea of the philosopher king, which we also have in antiquity. By contrast, the common sense tradition says everyone has common sense and everyone should participate in forming the government and addressing the issues of body politics together, either through representation, which the if the organization is too large, you have to have representation in the sense, or directly as in the form of the Athenian democracy that I was talking about before. I would like to look at a philosopher now named Immanuel Kant, who has talked about some of these ideas as well. Kant argued the fact that, that there would be a public, that a public or a publicum, as he called it, a public sphere, really, the public, should enlighten itself is nearly inevitable. This is a citation. If only it is granted freedom. The public would enlighten itself it is, if, it was, if it is granted freedom. For there will always be found some who think for themselves and who will spread among the herd, a herd of people, he uses this funny expression, herd, in the sense of the other people, um, who will spread around to the other people, you would say today, the spirit of rational assessment of individual worth and the vocation of each man to think for himself. This is a slow process for a public can achieve enlightenment only gradually, writes Kant. A revolution may perhaps bring about the fall of an autocratic despotism and of an, uh, of an overbearing oppression, but it can never bring about the true reform of a way of thinking, he writes. Indeed, in this process towards the development of critical thought, nothing more is required than freedom he writes, the freedom to make a public use of one's reason in all matters and not just in the private sense. A social and political order that encourages freedom of thought and a free use of reason in the public sphere welcomes this activity in the public realm beyond private life. The term public sphere, also called public forum or public arena or the marketplace of ideas, may be understood as encapsulating the totality of human sociality in its public dimension, and more precisely, the specific realm between the private life and the political structures of governing society. John Dewey was one of the major thinkers that built on this idea and contributed to this idea of the dynamic interplay of reflexivity in the process of public discourse. Dewey was one of the first to conceptualize the idea of the public as used in contemporary sociology. He argued in 1927 that at the fundamental level, the public is a self-emerging group of people who recognize their shared situation and seek to improve it or influence it together. 
coming to understand this interconnected nature of social life and seeking to guide and the influencing powers in their consequential nature is essentially the birth of a public. The social philosophy is basically a cultural theory of democracy, providing a theoretical reflection on the underlying dynamic of political reality. Democracy is understood as a moral approach of living together. The work of deliberation, participation, argumentation, and the general challenge and exchange of ideas. There are multiple publics, as Dewey sometimes refers to them in the plural, and holding these various publics together is the great challenge of democracy. If one of his famous lines, Dewey argued that the cure for the ailments of democracy is more democracy. By this, he means that problems and disagreements about truth have to be discussed publicly in the public sphere in order for them to be re resolved or managed. In his thinking, this has to do with a quote, free give and take, a fullness of integrated personality is therefore possible to achieve since the polls and responses of different groups reinforce one another and their values accord. Regarded as an idea, democracy is not an alternative to other principles of associated life. It is the idea of community life together, end quote. He proposed a vision of not an exclusive community, but of a great community in which this give and take is enacted and in which there is an accordance of values. While unique individuals always emerge within dif different groups, this is the essence of democracy and its purpose for it is embodied the art of communication, which enables a space for this give and take and works to form a general coherence and accordance of values in the body politic. Democracy will have its consummation when free social inquiry is indissolubly wedded to the art of full and moving communication, wrote Dewey. The public is the realm of this community forming communication in which democracy is perfected as a great community involving everyone. One of the core elements of democracy is thus the dynamic exchange of arguments, of ideas and rationally grounded claims in the free public sphere, even religious claims through open channels of communication. This dynamic exchange aids the public in decision-making and ultimately in self-governance. Today, the broader dynamics of the public sphere have changed, especially when one compares our situation to Dewey's time in the 1920s or the situation even of the middle and the late 20th century. The speed of communication has changed since the internet and the mediums of communication have changed, but also the official organs of news and the authorities and sources which interpret them. Even the very posture of the media and media communication has undergone a transformation, including its role in society at large. Beyond this, the public sphere today is often corrupted with misinformation as a general issue of human nature, this is obviously not new, and it has plagued, plagued every free society and democratic culture since their emergence. There is no way to eliminate this entirely, for freedom of opinion and the freedom of wrong opinion is a constitutional right in all modern democracies. In the American tradition, this is anchored in, in the Bill of Rights, so the, the first 10 amendments of the uh, Constitution where it says that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and the petition of the government for a redress of grievances. In other liberal democracies around the world, we have similar statements which anchor freedom of speech in this sense. Yet there are limits to the expression of this freedom, and it is not absolute. With view to the American tradition, we have the case um, in um, Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire in 1942, where the Supreme Court Justice Murphy wrote that there are certain well-defined and narrowly limited classes of speech, the, prevent the prevention and punishment of which has never been thought to raise any constitutional problem. These include the lewd and obscene, the profane, and, and so forth. 
these forms of speech are intended to hurt people. They're intended to be hateful. They're intended to do damage. And these forms of speech can be limited in free liberal democracies like the United States. They can, there is not a, a sense of the absolute freedom of speech in this way. Speech can be limited in this, in this sense. Yet beyond the limited range of unprotected expression, public discourse in free societies and specifically the validity claims of opposing parties and opposing representatives of ideological positions stand under the critical watch of civil society and are tested by rational discourse within the broader public sphere. The various claims to truth must always be examined and debated in this free public sphere of the public discussion. Without this free public sphere of debate and education of the public to read and to think critically in school, to learn history and moral thought, a true democratic order cannot be established and misinformation, lies and deception will go unchecked and will not be corrected. Beyond this, there is always, there's another question which is equally challenged, challenging today. How can instances of misinformation be unmasked when the broader dynamics of sociality today drive us into isolating and self-differentiating enclaves in which only those information sources are embraced, which are carefully selected to affirm the preconceptions of the echo chambers in which we all live to different degrees? This is a difficult question that cannot be addressed in all its dimensions here. Briefly, however, I would emphasize that it is necessary to keep the bridges of communication open between the various parties of a democratic political body to allow each party within the larger social order to, to, uh, of a given national context to speak freely and to seek to understand one another. Ultimately, it requires a sense of mutuality and reciprocity a realization that the future prosperity of each party within a given political order is dependent upon the cooperation between the parties. A great danger of, uh, to this sense of reciprocity is seen in the enclave mentality or what sociologists sometimes call homophily. Homophily is the tendency to associate with people like oneself or to spend time and read and listen to people who think like oneself. This is a fixed part of human life and sociality and will always be a factor of human existence, but it can be dangerous for political order, for a political order if it leads to the radical separation of groups and a breakdown of social interaction. Churches and especially larger ecumenical groups like this great institution in Lviv, in which we are gathered today, can do a great deal to overcome this and bring us into discussion with other people who think differently than we do. We must strengthen the areas of mutual interaction and encourage ideologically diverse spaces where the freedom of thought and speech is cultivated in a sense of dialogue and in the search for truth. This realization of reciprocity is the great society that Dewey was talking about, and it is the essence of free democracy. We do not have to be friends with everyone in a political order and a political in different political parties in this process. And the other parties will often bother us and provoke us, and we may do the same to them, but we should never take the next step and claim that they are our enemy just because they provoke us or bother us with ideas that we do not agree with. The essence of free democracy implies this use of freedom in a way that, that may provoke others in truth-telling without demonizing them. Democracy thrives in this open exchange in the public sphere in which truth claims are both made and critically examined, keeping this process going and the great challenge is, is the great challenge in free democratic orders, this process of exchange and debate and open public dialogue about the truth. It requires, above all, humility and wisdom. Those are two virtues that are indispensable in every social and political order and which are central issues in religious education. In this sense, as well, religious communities and their virtue training uh, is essential 
or are essential for democracy today. So I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you for listening to the long chat and I look forward to the conversation with everybody.